everyone who believes and receives Christ has everlasting life and will be raised up again at the last day. Charles Spurgeon, in a letter to his father, said this uh, when he first started his career in ministry. He said, how I long to see thousands of men saved, but my great comfort is that some will be saved, some must be saved, some shall be saved, for it is written, all the Father gives me shall come to me, and if you have never invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, what are you waiting for? He's calling you now. Open up your heart and let the Savior in. So that's what brings us now to uh, verse 40 and 41. So again, we are reading John chapter 6, verses 40 through 71. And the title of our sermon this morning is called, To Whom Shall We Go? Uh, So let's jump in. Verse 40. Now, verse 40 is where we ended last week. It says this, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So again here, we we got to focus in on what is the Father's will. The Father's will is that everyone, not a few people, not a particular sect or race or uh, gender, uh, everyone, that is the Father's will, He says, I would like for everyone who looks upon my son Jesus to believe in him so that they can have eternal life. That is the will of the Father. You know, we we often, uh, I'm sure you guys have all had the uncomfortable conversation where, well, if God loves people, then why do bad things happen to good people? Well, because that's life. I mean, bad things happen to good people all the time, but that's how God gets our attention. Uh, And sometimes there's a lot of really good people who are not walking with the Lord. Uh, You know, they're they're good in that they they aren't drunkards. They don't beat up on their kids. They don't uh, they don't mistreat their wife. They are very giving and and generous, but they still don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's often in the really bad times where a friend or family member is diagnosed with cancer or something goes on to disrupt our business or our job. And suddenly we find ourselves in this state of despair from a financial standpoint. Uh, And it's the very thing that drives us to seek out God, because oftentimes uh, when we're not seeking out God, uh, we don't even think about it. You know, that's why this this Easter holiday is such an interesting holiday, because so many people, I mean, if you guys go onto Facebook right now, you're going to see happy Easter from people you didn't even know knew who Jesus was. And yet here they are, happy Easter. But they're celebrating the holiday, not celebrating the reason for the holiday. You know, we've got Easter baskets, we've got cute and fuzzy bunnies, we've got Cadbury cream eggs, we've got, you know, dipping eggs. And uh, I mean, there's so many traditions that are tied to and about uh, Easter. You know, for many, it's the, the celebration of, of of spring and it's kids getting to go and get a nice, pretty new dress and some uh, nice clothes so they can go to church with their grandparents on this day. But God wants so much more of our time and our energy and our efforts. He wants to have a relationship with us, not just twice a year, Easter and Christmas. He wants a relationship with us on a daily basis. That's what he's looking for. And so this is what Jesus is telling the Jewish sect. Again, he's in Capernaum, uh, and he is now preaching to them in the synagogue there. So he's got a very large Jewish audience that is listening, including his 12 disciples. And then he goes into now what is a very, it's strange if you don't understand what he's talking about. So imagine now being a Jew, right? You've grown up in this very strict uh rules-based environment. You've got 2,100 different laws that you have to follow. At the age of 12, you've now memorized the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Uh, You believe that Moses is the king of everything. And so you have this perception of who God is, what God is, how God functions. Uh, I mean, you read the first five books of the Bible, you especially read uh, Leviticus. Wow. Wow. I mean, all of the rituals around the ceremonial cleansing and slaughtering of animals for the forgiveness of sins. I mean, it's it's a lot. 
And so now to hear this rabbi, this Jesus, uh, who has just recently come onto the scene. Now we know that Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. He was crucified at the age of 33. So it's only been three years. And so here now is this rabbi that everyone knows has been conducting miracles. Uh, he just got done just yesterday as we follow along chronologically in the text. It was just yesterday in our story that Jesus was feeding the 5,000 and there were baskets left over. So as Jesus feeds his people, there's, there's an abundant harvest here. And so they want more of that. Hey, let's follow this Jesus guy because it doesn't matter where we are. He's able to provide bread and feed us. This guy's awesome. Uh, let's just follow him around. Well, it's here in this text that Jesus is going to now get a little bit more serious about what's going on, the situation, and they're not going to like it. And many who have been following him, and guys, it's thousands of people. When it says that many of his disciples have left, his his core 12 say, but he will go on to say that many of them have left. Again, look at verse 60 in the text. It says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And they left. So thousands of people are going to hear Jesus speak the truth. And when the truth cuts into their lifestyle, when the truth cuts into the truths that they want to hold on to, the things that they want to believe, and it's it's counter to what they want to understand, they're like, I'm out of here. And it's not completely uncommon to what happens even today, right? We go to a church, uh, the pastor from the pulpit starts uh, quoting scripture to us, and there's something in that scripture that we don't like, we don't agree with, and we're out. Now, for a lot of people, that means we're going to go church shopping, we're going to go find a, uh, a church that says things the way that we want it said, and they do things the way we want them done. And sadly, for another group, they're just going to stop going to church altogether, uh, and that's Easter is a big day because a lot of people who have not stepped foot in a church in a long time are saying on this day, well, it is Easter Sunday. I guess I should go to church. And that's why, guys, we need to be praying all day long uh, for, again, the pastors and the children's ministry directors and the youth pastors and the worship leaders who are going to be encountering some of these folks for the first time in a long time that – the message would be exactly as the Lord would have it, and that people might be drawn back to a close relationship with Jesus Christ. That needs to be our prayer all day today. So Jesus is saying things that are unpopular. Uh, verse 41, this, of course, leads the Jews to begin grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now, the religious leaders were grumbling because, one, they could not believe Jesus' claim to be God. Uh, that, was, that was the big one. But now here, Jesus is saying, wait a minute. I am the bread that came down from, from heaven. Now, what the, what the Jewish religious leaders are thinking here is they're referring to Exodus chapter 17, verse 3. So if you hang a left in your Bible and go to Exodus... Here's what it says. It says, but the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children livestock die of thirst? Here they're grumbling. They're a grumbling people. But now the reason that they're grumbling isn't because they're not being fed. Uh, they're no longer wandering in the desert. That was hundreds of years ago before this text. But God took care of them in the desert. Every morning, manna would fall from heaven, uh, and it was a it was a bread like substance. Some have described it to be like a frosted flake, right? Uh, it's it's wheat, it's corn, it's crunchy, it's sweet. Um, but that's what they ate every morning for forty years. In the evening, quail would fly through the camp, and they would have quail to eat every night for forty years. And everybody knew that it was God providing this manna from heaven through Moses. But now when Jesus makes this claim, I am the bread sent from heaven, they're going, whoa, are you, you think you're better than Moses? 
Moses, the guy that led us out of captivity? Who do you think you are, dude? So they can't accept the claim of divinity. They can't understand what he's saying now. But here's the truth of this. Many people reject Christ because they say they cannot believe he is the son of God. In reality, the demands that Christ makes for their loyalty and obedience are what they can't accept. So to protect themselves from the message, they reject the messenger. I'm going to say that again. The demands that Christ makes for their loyalty and obedience are what they can't accept. So to protect themselves from the message, they reject the messenger. See, I believe that there's a lot of people out there who believe in Jesus. Uh, they want to have a closer relationship with him. They would like to go to church more often. They would like to uh, do more within their family as it relates to God's word, but they don't want to subscribe to the rest of it. They don't want to stop drinking and cussing and swearing and carousing and, and doing all of these things that they, they believe you can't do as a Christian. Well, here's the thing you guys got to understand. There is no list of things you can't do as a Christian, right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say not to have, not to drink. It simply says not to get drunk with wine. Nowhere in their Bible does it says you have to be this straight-laced, you know, suit and tie wearing person uh, that goes to church 29 times a week. Doesn't say that anywhere. Being a Christian is simply about acknowledging that Jesus is God's son, that he died on the cross to save us from our sins, and that he rose again on the third day, that being this day, this Easter, and he now lives in heaven and he's interceding for us on behalf of us to the Father. That's it. All you got to do is believe it and receive it. And when I say receive, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because God says, well, when you believe in me, I will send the Holy Spirit to be your comforter, your guidance, your counselor. So when you accept Jesus Christ, you, would, you receive the Holy Spirit. And now it's not a bunch of things that I can't do. It's now things that I just really don't have a desire to do. Because I don't want to be anywhere that my Lord and Savior would not be comfortable going. I don't want to be looking at or watching anything that would make my Lord and Savior uncomfortable if we were sitting there watching it together. And I don't want to do or say anything that's going to make my Lord and Savior uncomfortable. So other than that, I mean, what's the problem? Well, the problem is a lot of people feel like, well, if I turn my life over to Jesus, I'm going to have to completely change and I, I like my life, and I like me, and I like our family, and I, I don't think that there's any problems. Therefore, I don't need to change anything. Well, that's a really unfortunate position to take, because if you die in your sins, meaning you don't invite Jesus into your heart, you don't ask for forgiveness of the past sins, then you die in sin. You know, I've said this before, and it continues to come back to me. You know, when we think about hell, uh, and this is not a hellfire and brimstone sermon, I uh, rest assured. But when we think about the fact that there is a heaven and there is a hell, if you want to break it down into its simplest parts, right? Heaven is being in a place where you and God will dwell together for eternity. Because on earth you loved God and you wanted to be with him. Hell is a place where God cannot and will not exist and will not go. Therefore, hell is spending an eternity separated from God. And that would be hell, not to mention all of the other things that we read about hell in the Bible, but that those are the choices, right? It's either eternity in heaven with Jesus, or it's an eternity in hell without him. You decide, but we decide right now on this planet, on this side of death, we decide what will we do with Jesus? Will we accept him as Lord and Savior, or will we reject him as Lord and Savior? The decision and the choice that you make on earth while you're living, is the decision that will have been made when you pass away and the place that you go. Now, the crowd, of course, rejects Jesus' statement. Verse 42, they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? Now, they, their concern was that they're like, wait a minute, this is Joseph and Mary's kid. Who does this guy think he is? He came, he's the bread of life. He's the one, he's the man who came down from heaven. It's a pretty bold statement. Now, here they are again, murmuring. 
Jesus says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, it says this, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Murmur not, Jesus said, we have a saying that the squeaky wheel gets the grease first. However, murmuring and complaining are sort of acceptable to us. But understand that sometimes rather than getting the grease, the squeaky wheel gets replaced. Here these people are murmuring and saying, eh, I don't believe it. I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to follow. I'm not going to walk with him. And God says, okay, but understand, if you choose not to follow me here on this planet, you'll choose not to be with me in eternity. Verse 43, stop grumbling amongst yourself, Jesus answered. No one can come to, the fa- can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to him. Now, God, not man, plays the most active role in salvation. When someone chooses to believe in Jesus as Savior, he or she does so only in response to the urging of God's Holy Spirit. God does the urging. Then we decide whether or not to believe. Thus, no one can believe in Jesus without God's help. Now, many of you are here this morning for the first time, and you're not really sure why. Why am I listening to this? Why am I watching this? Why am I here? Well, you're here because God has been prompting you. Uh, God has been, you know, putting, he's been whispering into your ear, you know, you need to know me. You need to have a relationship with my son, Jesus. You need to know the one that I sent to die on the cross for you. You need to know. And so here you are asking questions, being curious. But here's what you need to know. Again, going back to verse four, back to verse 40. My father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. So God's will is that every single person here watching accept him and receive him and his son Jesus and that they would have eternal life. That's God's desire. And so he's prompted you to be here And we are all praying for you right now. We got people praying for you that you would accept and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Verse 46. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Now, this is Jesus referring to himself. Only Jesus has seen the Father. And he says, I tell you the truth. He who believes in me has everlasting life. Now, the religious leaders frequently asked Jesus to prove to them why he was better than the prophets they already had. Jesus here is referred to the manna that Moses had given their ancestors in the wilderness. This is Exodus chapter 16. Uh, This bread was physical and temporal. The people ate it, and it sustained them for a day. But they had to get more bread every day, and this bread could only keep them from dying. Jesus, who is much greater than Moses, offers himself as the eternal bread from heaven that satisfies completely and leads to eternal life. And that's why he says now in verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. And if you don't have that verse underlined in your Bible, underline that verse in your Bible. I am the bread of life. Now, when the crowd said, well, wait a minute, we know this guy. He's he's the son of Joseph. Jesus didn't correct them because the real issue was that they simply believe that he is the bread bread sent from heaven, which is an impossible feat for them unless the Father drew them. Unless the Father drew them. Now, this is going to come in really handy uh, as we come to the close of our time together this morning, because that is a very pivotal and critical verse, unless the Father drew them. Now, the reason this is so important, and for all of you, I should say for all of us who are in full-time ministry, and by the way, let me explain, full-time ministry is simply a person who has accepted Jesus into their heart and made him their Lord and Savior, and recognize and realizes that from that day forward, everywhere God places them, they are in ministry. 
So full-time ministry, at least in my opinion, does not mean you've quit your job and you're now on salary at the church That and you think that's full-time ministry. No, that's not what full-time ministry means. Or it means that you've chucked everything and you've moved down to South Africa and you're, you're serving in some third world village there and that's full-time ministry. No, that's not my opinion what full-time ministry is. Full-time ministry is every moment of every day that you are awake and moving. God is strategically placing people around you, in front of you, behind you, uh, giving visibility to you so that people can see and hear and know. And ultimately, that through your life, your example, they'll want to know who Christ is. And they'll come to know him through watching you. Uh, I think it was Dana who prayed, Lord, uh, help us to be evangelists without opening our mouths. Uh, and that's so true. Does our life reflect the values that Jesus has? Verse 49, your forefathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. Now, John Porson, in his commentary, he said this. He said, the human being can survive longer on bread than any other substance. Although it is baked in different ways and fixed in different forms, bread is truly cross-cultural. It's also extremely palatable, for most of us eat some sort of bread every day. I want you to think about that. Just think about yesterday. How much bread did you eat yesterday or all of last week, right? Bread is like a, a staple in every single human's diet nationwide. Uh, we went to this Indian restaurant uh, a few months ago. And they, it was almost like a, it was kind of like a crepe material or, or consistency. Uh, I don't even remember what grain it was, but it was very thin and puffy. And so they bring you this big bowl with this liner of bread filled in it. And then they'd put all the stuff in the middle and then you would tear it off and roll it up. Uh, if you haven't had any Ethiopian food, it's good. And this whole process was interesting, but even in Ethiopia, the staple is bread, different from ours, but still bread in and of itself. So this whole concept of bread should resonate with every single person. And that's why Jesus told parables and he used things that were relatable because who hasn't eaten bread recently? But the most intriguing aspect about Jesus's identification with bread is the process by which bread is made. That is, a seed of grain is planted in the ground. After some weeks, it springs up and grows into maturity. Then it is cut down, ground up, and placed in the fire. And after it is thoroughly baked, it is enjoyed by humanity. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. A seed was planted in the womb of Mary, miraculously. God incarnate came forth and grew to maturity. That is Jesus. He was cut down as he was pinned to the cross ground up as he was cursed and spat upon and placed in the fire of God's wrath as he absorbed all of our sin. And because he had been planted, cut down, ground up and burned in the very fire of God's wrath, you and I now have the opportunity to eat of him daily, never tiring of him, always receiving strength and sustenance for the challenges of any given day. Truly, Jesus is the bread of life. And what a perfect analogy. I thought that was so interesting. I mean, to put it into that perspective, and especially, you know, I, I didn't prepare a, you know, special Easter sermon specifically for Easter Sunday. As you guys know, we go book by book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, line by line. And we have been for the last 15 years. So the fact that here we are reading about the bread of life, on this Sunday, isn't God cool? I, I just love how all of that comes together. So verse 51, he goes on. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Okay, now this is where everybody who's listening is going to start going, wait a minute. When he says, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, here's the question. How can Jesus give us his flesh 
to eat. I mean, that just that's cannibalistic, isn't it? That's cannibalism. We can't eat somebody else's flesh. Well, to eat living bread means to accept Christ into our lives and become unified with him. And we are unified with Christ in two ways. Number one, by believing in his death and the sacrifice of his flesh and his resurrection. So that's the first way that we're unified with Christ. And then the second way is by devoting ourselves to living as he requires, depending on his teaching for guidance and trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it, right? Christianity is not that difficult to comprehend. It's simply acknowledging that Jesus is who he says he is. He is God's son and he is God. And that he died on the cross. And that it's through his death and resurrection that our sins have been forgiven. That's step one. Step two, now devoting ourselves to living as he requires. Depending on his depending on his teaching for guidance and trusting in the Holy Spirit for power. You know, the thing I love most, uh, there's a lot that I love about the Christian life, about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I can tell you, I think the thing that uh, I appreciate more than anything else is that there's nothing going on in my life presently, in the past or in the future, that wasn't God-ordained. Now, I've got a pretty interesting past, and there are things in it that I wish didn't happen, but they did. And God uses those things to give us our testimony. He takes our tests and makes them our testimony. He takes our mess and he makes it our message. And so there's nothing that you have done in the past. There's nothing that you're currently doing that prohibits you or keeps you from coming to faith in Jesus Christ. He's calling you. The, the very fact that you're here is because he loves you and he wants you to know that he wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't care what's gone on in your past. That's what he died on the cross for, was the forgiveness of all sins of mankind, past, present, future. Once you accept and receive, that's it. But some people just like to carry that burden. Oh, but you don't understand. I was such a terrible person. Well, get in line, right? Nobody's got a story worse than somebody else's. Uh, and if you are the guy or the gal that's got absolutely the worst story of everyone else's, well, God loves you and he can forgive you too. And he already did the work. He already died on the cross. You simply need to acknowledge and receive that. So here is the Jews are wondering, uh, verse 52 says, then the Jews begin to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's weird. So the Jews are sitting here trying to figure out what he means. And so Jesus began to explain the absolute necessity of their taking his teaching and applying it personally. In other words, they would have to eat of his body or they would not live. Now, biblically, we can understand what it means to eat of Jesus when we understand what happened to Adam and Eve, when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good, of good and evil. It was after they ate the forbidden fruit, they fell because they no longer were completely and constantly dependent on the Father. You see, prior to the fall, whenever Adam and Eve had questions, whenever they had problems, whenever they might be confused about something, they would say, Lord, what should we do? But once they ate of the forbidden fruit, they became independent, and they no longer talked to their Abba or their Papa or their Father. And instead, they said, Hey, you know, we know what's good. We we know what's evil. We know how to handle this. We know how to accomplish that. But here Jesus is saying, look, you've eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it led to your fall. Now Jesus is saying, eat of me. I am the tree of life. Internalize me and allow me to come into the deepest recess of your being and allow me to come into the deepest uh, recess of your being and allow me to take control of your life. Now, practically, we can understand what it means to eat of Jesus when we realize that although we can get by without exercise, excitement, or education, we can't get by without eating. Now, we may do a lot of things that we think we should do, but there is one thing we should make sure that we do, and that is that we eat, right? Not many people go very many days without having a meal. 
And it doesn't matter if it's top ramen or it is, you know, the, the lowest end of the food spectrum you can imagine, people eat. It's like a necessity of life. You got to eat. And so that's the point that Jesus is making here. He's saying, look, you eat physical food every single day to keep your body healthy, to give yourself energy. And so the point he's making is, why would you not eat of me on a daily basis? Meaning consume God, consume Jesus by being in his word. So it's not physically eating his flesh. That's weird. Uh, but it is being in his word and physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally having a big bite of Jesus right out of the Bible as he speaks this through his word. The best thing, you guys, that we can do as Christians is to be in prayer and to be in his word. And these are both individual things, right? It doesn't have to be corporate. Well, not so sure I want to be a Christian because I don't want to have to go to church every Sunday. There is no requirement that you coming to a faith in Jesus Christ means that you suddenly have to start going to church every Sunday. So if that's what's holding you back, good news. You don't have to go to church every Sunday. Wow, I don't want to do the small group thing. I don't like being in small groups. I don't like sharing my feelings. Okay, great. Go to a church that doesn't do small groups. There's, there's a lot of them. There's no requirement. There is no expectation from God beyond just inviting him into your heart and making him your Lord and Savior. That's it. After that, it's between you and him. As the Holy Spirit enters your life and begins to lead you and guide you, what you'll realize is that you will crave more time with Jesus. Just like we get hungry for food, if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, you should get hungry for God's word. When you walk into church on Sunday morning, you should be famished because you it's been too long. I, I need God's word. I need to have it now. Another commentator said this. He said, you know, mystically, we can understand what it means to eat of Jesus when we come to communion. Now, Paul wrote that many in the church at Corinth were weak and sick and had even died unnecessarily because they had not given worth to the Lord's table. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. Now, the same, in a sense, is still true. I believe the reason so much of Protestant Christianity is sterile and boring and impotent is because a lot of Protestants, in an overreaction to Catholicism, have reduced the importance and the necessity of the Eucharist. Now, the Eucharist is, in, in Catholic churches, it is the wafer that is placed on the tongue of the person. Now, in the Catholic faith, it is believed that the, the Eucharist turns literally into God's flesh or Jesus' flesh. And when they take communion, they're actually taking of God's flesh or Jesus' flesh. Now, there is tremendous power in the Lord's Supper. Now, this is John Corson. He says, while I do not believe that the elements, that is the bread and the wine, are literally transformed into the Lord's body and blood, neither do I believe that they are nothing more than symbols. For I have experienced grace and power at the communion table that I have found nowhere else. Perhaps that is why Satan seems to try to keep people away from communion even more than keeping them from Bible study. Now, the point that the commentator is making here is the importance of communion. Now, often on Easter Sunday, a lot of churches will not have communion because they don't want to weird people out, right? So if you haven't been to church, you know, since Christmas time, or maybe this morning, this Easter Sunday is going to be the first time you've been to church in 10 years, Again, I don't have a church. I What we do here is not church. This is Bible study. Um, you need to have your own uh, fellowship in your own market. You need to have a church that you go to, that you fellowship, and you have a church family that you are associated with. Uh, it's important that we surround ourselves with like-minded people. Uh, but a lot of people will not hold communion on this Easter Sunday because they don't want to have to try to explain it to people who are not Christians who are not walking with the Lord, because a lot of people think that it's weird, because communion can be explained in a, in a myriad of ways, 
And when somebody tells you that, hey, this thing that I'm putting on your tongue is going to transform into Jesus's literal flesh. Whoa, that's weird. Or what about when somebody says, hey, this this grape juice that I'm handing you is going to turn into Jesus's blood and you're going to drink it literally. That's weird, right? So anybody that's coming into a church for the first time and hearing that is going to be like, whoa, what is this? Now, what I just described to you is what the Catholic Church believes to be true. I go to a non-denominational church called Calvary Chapel. We believe that communion, the bread and the wine, or the bread and the juice, are, are merely representations of doing exactly what Jesus is calling us to do here in John chapter 6, and that is to eat of the flesh. So it is, it is intaking the bread of Jesus. It is intaking the blood of Jesus, not literally, okay, but figuratively so that we can be reminded of what he did for us on the cross, the, the, the pain and the agony that he took on our behalf. And so when we take of that bread, we're being reminded of Jesus giving his body for us, taking the punishment that we so rightfully deserve. He's doing that. And when we consume that piece of bread, it's, a, it's merely a reminder of Jesus' love for us. And then when we take the drink of the, some churches use actual wine, other churches use grape juice, but it is to remind us of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross because it is his blood that covers our sins. It is his sacrifice that we get to spend an eternity in heaven with him. So communion doesn't need to be weird, but the point that the commentator that Corson is making here is communion is important because we need to be reminded of what Jesus did on the cross because it's everything. Right? Without Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, none of us would be able to go to heaven because nobody can earn their way in. There's, there's no amount of good works you can possibly ever do that is going to get you into heaven outside of coming through Jesus Christ. Verse 53, and Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his cup, you have no life in you. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Now, again, think about the Jews hearing this for the first time. This is a shocking message to eat flesh and drink blood sounds cannibalistic. I mean, the idea of drinking any blood, let alone human blood, was repugnant to the, to the religious leaders because the law forbade it. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. Now, Jesus was not talking about literal blood, of course. He was saying that his life had to become their own but they could not accept this concept. And the apostle Paul later used the body and blood imagery in talking about communion. So Jesus is merely making the point, I am the bread of heaven. God sent me. He sent manna when your ancestors were wandering in the desert and needed sustenance. And now he has sent me to every single one of you because you're wandering in a desert called sin and the only way out of it is to accept and receive a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. It's all Jesus is saying here. Now, verse 58, he says, This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And again, he said this while teaching at the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, on hearing this, verse 60, Many of his disciples said, Lord, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And Jesus says in verse 61, he says, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Now, the point Jesus is making, he's saying, look, if this offends you, verse 62, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? If you find this offensive, how are you going to feel when you see me ascend to heaven by way of the cross. 
really? You're offended by this? Well, you're not going to be real excited when I suddenly am not here anymore. Because in just a matter of days, the, the, the Jews are going to crucify me, and I'm going to allow them to do so, because that's why God sent me, was as the sacrificial lamb. He said, but, and if you're getting offended by me calling myself the bread of life and telling you that you need to eat of me, which means uh, be with me, think on me, pray with me, worship me on a daily basis, he goes, you're really going to be offended by the cross. 62. So what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Now, we're not able to comprehend intellectually the mystery of the Lord's table or what it means to eat of him personally. It is only by the Spirit that we can receive revelations. Verse 64, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Now, Jesus here, he doesn't plead with those who left. And he didn't go on to say, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Hey, before you go, you know, let me just explain this a little bit further. Because I can see you're confused. I can see that maybe you're offended by what I had to say. So don't don't leave. Don't leave. That's not, exa- that's not at all how Jesus handles this. Rather, he doesn't run after them. He doesn't try to reason with them because he knew they could not understand unless the Father had drawn them. Now, here's the truth around this. And this, this was so comforting to me when I read this. Listen, sometimes we spend hours talking and days dialoguing when we should be following the example of Jesus, realizing that unless the Father is drawing somebody, no one can come. I sense such a relaxedness in the ministry of Jesus Christ, not striving, not struggling, not straining to persuade. He simply shared the truth, knowing that the Spirit would give application in the hearts of those the Father had drawn. I love this, right? Because every Sunday morning, you guys, we have a laundry list of people that we are praying for. We have family that we're praying for. We have friends and coworkers and neighbors and grandkids and nephews and nieces that we are praying for. And, and it's to the point where it's, it's almost like a desperate plea, Lord, please. Have so-and-so come to know you as as Lord and Savior. Lord, I'm pleading with you. Just can they please come to know you? And, and, And we take it personally, right? And so every time we're with them, we want to get into a religious discussion. Every time we go to dinner, we want to hit them with the gospel. But here's why this is so freeing. You all have heard the the statement. I don't know who said it. I think Yoda might get credit for this, but the, the quote is, Uh, When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Putting a biblical context or spin on that, it would be this. When God has led a person to seek out Jesus, they will be ready to hear from you or whoever God has placed in their path in that moment for them to accept and receive Christ. Now, why is this so encouraging to me? Why does this bring me so much peace and comfort? Because it's a reminder, guys, we do not save anybody. We do not have the ability to save anybody. All we've been called to do is to be ready in season and out of season to preach the love of Christ. That's it. Our message is often going to fall on deaf ears. Our message is often going to be rejected by people that we really have been praying for and we want them to hear and we want them to come to know Christ, but it will not happen until God has called them to seek him out. Uh, Verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Now again, the very fact that you are here watching this right now for the first time, never been here before, and you don't even remember how you got here, but you clicked on something, and here you are watching this, it's because God, the Father, has enabled you 
to seek him out. So God has made you realize that you have this Jesus-shaped hole inside your heart, and you're looking to fill it. You're looking for truth. You're looking to know and understand who this Jesus is. You want to know, what is this eternal life? Why is why are my Christian neighbors always so calm and, and so relaxed? I, I want what they have. How do I get what they have? And so God has enabled you to be here because he wants you to hear the message of his salvation through his son, Jesus. Now, again, why is this comforting for me? Because, guys, over the years, I've had numerous conversations with people that were seeking out Jesus, and it was obvious they were seeking out Jesus. And in that moment, I have been blessed to be used by God to help walk them to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior but it had nothing to do with me. I was just there in the moment that God called them to himself. That's why the Bible tells us to be ready in season and out of season, because we may be called to share the gospel in, in, the, in the strangest of places. And, and you just never know. You know, I remember a few weeks ago, I got a random text from a guy that I've known, but we have never, ever in our lives spoke spiritual things. Never. It was always business. And out of the blue, he sends me a text. He says, Lee, I'd like to talk with you. I said, well, well, that's great. I said, can you give me some context about what it is you want to talk about? And I can't, uh, I'm paraphrasing this, but the, the gist of the text was, I've been really stressed out lately. My business is not going the way that I would like it to be going. And you always seem so calm about things. I'd like to know why. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but that, again, was the general gist of it. And so we jumped on the phone. And within 30 seconds, he's, he's in tears. And I asked him, I said, do you know Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And he says, well, I thought I did. But the way I've been feeling lately, I don't think that I do. And I said, well, would you like to? He said, yeah, I think I would. I said, great, then let's pray together. And right there on that call, we prayed together. And he invited Jesus into his heart, and he made him his Lord and Savior. Fast forward, just I just saw him this week. A different guy, completely changed. What's the difference? He came to know this Jesus. He, he ate of the bread from heaven. Verse 66, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, why did Jesus' words cause many of his followers to desert him? Well, first of all, they may have realized that he wasn't going to be the conquering Messiah. He wasn't the king that they were expecting. Or it could have been that he refused to give in to their self-centered requests. Lord, give us more miracles. Show us more signs. We want to see more wondrous things from you. He wasn't giving it to them. Or perhaps the third reason they may have left is because Jesus is emphasizing faith, not deeds. You know, I, I truly believe that mankind would prefer a religion of works than a religion of faith because everybody wants to know what must they do to get to heaven? How do I earn salvation? <laughs> well, you can't earn anything. We are all sinners. We deserve death. It's only through Jesus' death and resurrection that we have the gift of eternal life if we accept it and receive it by faith. And it doesn't now mean this laundry list of things we now have to go do. We just need to accept by faith. And the fourth reason that perhaps they didn't want to stick around is his teachings were difficult to understand, and some of his words were offensive. You know, I was reading the Bible the other day, and God said something that was offensive to me. Uh, he said that the, the man is the head of the household, and I think that's, that's old school. Men and women are equal, and I have just as much say in my household as my husband does. Well, that's true, but there is an order in the household. God, the, the man is, is the headship of Christ, and as the man of the house, as the husband, as the father, it is my job to administer uh, faith throughout my family, and my wife is to be submissive to me in that. Now, submissive doesn't mean do everything I say when I say it. No, we, we're a team, right? But still, there's an order, a godly order. And people really struggle with this. They wrestle against it. They find it offensive. And so because it's offensive or 
I don't understand it well enough. I'm out of here. Now, here's another truth. As we grow in our faith, we may be tempted to turn away because Jesus's lessons are difficult. Will your response be to give up or perhaps ignore certain teachings or just reject Christ altogether? But instead of doing that, ask God to show you what the teaching means and how it applies to your life. Then have the courage to act on God's truth. Now, you guys will notice that uh, every Sunday morning when we read the Bible, after we read the Bible, we pray over what we're reading and we say, Lord, speak to me through your word. Lord, clear out any junk that's, that's blocking me from having a direct connection or communion with you. And Lord, speak to me through your word. That is a prayer, you guys, that you should be praying every time you open up the Bible to, to study. Lord, cleanse my heart of any sin, unre any unrepentance in that might be there. And Lord, help me to be focused. Help me to be attentive. Lord, please block out any distractions that could come my way as I'm studying your word. And Lord, I pray now that you would speak to me through your word and that you would lead me and guide me through the power of your Holy Spirit. Again, that is a prayer that should always be prayed when the Bible is opened and read. Why? Because that's exactly what we want. We want God to speak to us through his word because we know that that's how God speaks to us is through his word. Verse 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. You see, there's no middle ground with Jesus. When he asked the disciples if they would also like to leave, he was showing that they could either accept or reject him. Jesus was not trying to repel people with his teaching. He was simply telling the truth. And the more the people heard Jesus' real message, the more they divided into two camps. One, honest seekers who wanted to understand more. Or two, those who rejected Jesus because they didn't like what they heard. Now, there might be somebody watching right now who used to go to church. But again, something was said, somebody did something that offended you. Uh, maybe the pastor said something in such a way that you, you took a great offense to it. And so you left and you have been rejecting God, avoiding God, cursing God, wanting nothing to do with God. And yet here you are. Because God has been reminding you of this Jesus-shaped hole that's in your heart. And the only way that you're going to have fulfillment is to acknowledge, Lord, I, I took offense to something that I probably shouldn't have. And I probably blew it out of proportion and I made it a bigger deal than it needed to be. And Lord, I've really missed our time together. I've really missed being with you. I've really missed the comfort of knowing that you've got me and that you're leading me, and you're guiding me, and that I'm walking according to your footsteps and going where you would have me to go. So, Lord, help me to forgive the person who said the offensive thing. Help me to love them, Lord, the way that you love them. Help me to die selfishly to myself so that I can have a relationship with that person. After many of Jesus' followers had deserted him, he asked his 12 disciples if they were also going to leave. And Peter replied, to whom shall we go? In this straightforward way, Peter answered for all of us, there isn't anywhere else to go. There's no other way. Now, there are many philosophies and self-styled authorities, uh, but Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. People look everywhere for eternal life, and they miss Christ, who is the only source. Stay with him, especially when you're confused or feel alone. But when Peter said, Lord, where else can we go? You know, too often our answer is, well, we can go to the movie or we can go on a vacation or we can go over here and do that. Or, you know what, instead of going to church on Sunday mornings, let's go celebrate nature with a hike or golfing or whatever. I mean, we can easily fill in the blanks of that question. Where would I go? But Peter had already done all of the world's stuff. And he knew that it was meaningless and bankrupt. Where, Lord, where else would I go? Now, I've been walking with the Lord for 41 years now. And there was a period uh, in my late teens and early 20s where I was not walking with the Lord. 
Um, and I got myself involved in all kinds of things that I shouldn't have been involved in. And when the Lord, if the Lord were to ask me, Lee, are you going to go too? I would pray that my response would be similar to Peter's. Lord, where else would I go? I've already done that. I've been there. I've experienced that. I've been to the keggers. I've been to the drunken parties. I've been to the drug dens. I've, I've done it. And, and it's emptiness. There's nothing there. So, Lord, where else would I go? Some of you might be here this morning because you, too, are at the end of your rope. You're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you're just done. You're over it. I'm done with the partying. I'm done with the 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 lifestyle lord i just want to i just want to be with you that's all i want let's go to 68 7 peter answered him and said lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life and we believe and know that you are the holy one of god now although they were no doubt excited and inspired by jesus's works peter and the boys were converted and committed by jesus's words May this be a place corporately, and may we be a people individually who understand that conversion and commitment are based not upon signs or miracles, entertainment or hype or hoopla, but on the word of God. I've heard people say, you don't want to study the Bible. We just want to move in the spirit. Yet I know how much more spirit-filled a meeting can be than one in which the words of Jesus Christ are proclaimed. For the words he speaks are spirit and life. Now, notice the order here. We believe and are sure. Now, people often say, I would believe if I could be sure. But the way of the Lord is always believe first, and then you will be sure. For it is only through faith that we can understand. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Now, for the person that is sitting here going, well, you know, I, I think I want to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but I'd like to know more. I'd like a little bit more convincing. And what the text is telling us here is, do you don't need any more convincing? Because there are portions of the Bible that you can never see, that you can never understand, that you will never know about, unless you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. They just... It won't open itself up to you. It won't reveal itself to you because you don't need to know. The only thing you need to know if you are not a believer, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to study this book backwards and forward and know it by heart. In fact, I know a lot of people who can quote scripture like crazy and they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. So knowing this is not what's going to change things for you. Knowing him is what's going to change things for you. And once you know him, you will suddenly begin to understand this. So God, God allows the unbeliever a very limited understanding of his works, his words, his plans for their life, because if they don't invite him in, if they don't ask him to come into their heart and make him their Lord and Savior— then none of those things he has planned for you matter, nor do you need to know, because you don't know him. You know, I don't just randomly call up a stranger and say, hey, you know, I, I see you authored a book here, and I was I was reading a couple pieces of it, and um, I'd like to go on vacation with you. Where are you going? <laughs> Whoa, who's this again? Why are you calling me? W how do you know me? Right? Similar thing. Until we open up and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's just certain things we don't need to know. God's not going to reveal to us. God's not going to tell us. But if you want to truly understand God's heart and who he is and what he is and how he is, the first thing you need to do is acknowledge what he's done and simply accept it and receive it and believe it. And then everything will open up to you. Verse 70, then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. And he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the 12, was later to betray him. In response to Jesus' message, some people left, others stayed, and truly believed. And some, like Judas, stayed, but tried to use Jesus for personal gain. 
Many people today turn away from Christ. Others pretend to follow Jesus by going to church for status or going to church for approval of family and friends or for business contacts. And after seeing the crowds walk away from him, I'm sure there was a moment, a, a momentary smile on Jesus' face as he looked at the 12 who stood beside him. Charles Spurgeon, in his commentary, he said this. He said, churches have summers like our gardens, and suddenly all things are full. But then winter comes, and alas, the empty seats are seen. Now, that's encouraging to me because even at our own church, we're seeing a lot of change. You know, our youth pastor has gotten married and is moving on to the next stage. Uh, a lot of friends and family members that we used to go to church with are now being called to go other places and do other things. And it's kind of like the fall as we see the leaves falling off and uh, the trees getting thinner and the, the seats getting thinner. But that's the way God works. He, 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 he grows things and he, he uh, makes things smaller. Sometimes things are growing and getting bigger and some things, people, things are withering and going away. But he's always on the throne. So in closing, why did so many abandon Jesus? Some may have been disappointed that Jesus refused to become the conquering king that they had anticipated. Others may have found Jesus' teaching baffling or his instructions threatening. But Jesus offers eternal life, but he does require that his followers accept him as their Lord and Savior. This means his agenda must become our agenda. And that is unacceptable to many would-be disciples. Again, Charles Spurgeon in his, in his commentary said this, when your will is God's will, you will have your will. I love that. When your will is God's will, then you will have your will. And that begs the question, are you maybe upset at God lately because things have not been going the way that you would like for them to be going? Are you disappointed or discouraged because things aren't going the way that you wanted them to go or things aren't happening as fast or or in the, in the way that you would like for them to happen or to go? But are you praying, Lord, your will be done? I mean, when you, when you sit down in your private devotion times and open up your Bible and pray and read, are you saying, Lord, let your will be done? And here's another prayer you could pray is, Lord, let your will be my will so that I don't have an agenda outside of your will. And here's the application. We often feel as though we lead in our relationship with God. In truth, he calls, we come. This understanding of God's initiative in salvation should make us more confident in evangelism, knowing that God is drawing people, and we can expect to see those whom the Father draws come to him. The preaching of the word of God always leads to a sifting of the hearts of the listeners. God draws sinners to the Savior through the power of truth and his word, and those who reject the word will reject the Savior, and those who receive the word will receive the Savior and experience the new birth, and that is eternal life. So the question is, do you feel your need because there's a spiritual hunger within you? Are you willing to admit that you need and you need to come to the Savior? Because if you will, he will satisfy you forever. There are only two real responses to Jesus. You either accept him or you reject him. That's it. You either accept him or you reject him. So let's not allow today to simply be a holiday where we celebrate the things that the world has told us are important on this day, like bunny rabbits and Easter eggs and Easter egg hunts and all of these worldly things. Let's acknowledge that today is the day that Jesus rose from the dead, that his grave was found empty and that we now can come to the Father through our faith in him. So if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior this morning, know that your presence here is not by accident. God called you to be here. And what he's asking you to do right now is to make a decision. Will you choose to continue living the life you've been living, or will you choose to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and invite him into your heart? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for 
your word. What a what a fitting message for this Easter Sunday. And Lord, I, I just pray for the person watching right now who doesn't know you. They they've been seeking, they've been searching, but they've never surrendered their life to you. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they surrender all, that they just turn their life over to you and that they invite you into their heart. And Lord, that they make you their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for the person today who has maybe been backslidden, whose relationship with you has been very distant. Uh, They've been busy. They've been stressed. They've been worried. They got a lot going on. And Lord, I pray that they would come to you, come back to you today and, and, and start a new, a fresh, uh, uh, invigorated relationship with you where they stay in your will, where they follow your will, where they desire to go where you would have them to go, where they would surrender their own personal agendas and allow you to lead and guide and direct. And Lord, I pray for everyone else who is walking with you and loves you and knows you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I thank you for their desire to just come and learn more. Lord, I pray that you would place in every one of our paths a person, a group, a people that need to hear your word, that need to experience your love, that need to invite you into their heart and make them make you their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would equip us, prepare us, and give us a heart for the lost. And Lord, that you would, that we would allow you to use us as your mouthpiece, as your spokesperson, and that in all things, in all places, Lord, that we would be bold for you. Lord, we commit these things to you. We ask these things, Lord. We we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, we we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I pray that today would truly be the day uh, that we are reminded of what God's done for us, or that we acknowledge it, or that we receive it, that we accept it, uh, but that uh, God is calling you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. Uh, he wants to be the Lord of your life. So let him do that. I uh, also want to remind you all about our upcoming Be Bold for Jesus conference. If you've not registered yet for that, uh, please go to bb4j.com. Uh, again, bb, the number 4j.com. That's beboldforjesus.com. Or you can learn more at heesthesolution.com. Either way, love to see you this October in Spokane for the sixth annual Be Bold for Jesus conference. Until then, see you next Sunday. Lord willing. Goodbye, everybody.